Without further ado, let's let that anticipation mean something. Let's welcome Milo Yiannopoulos. Thank you for that kind introduction. Um, I, I liked it especially because I wrote most of it. Um, <laughs> I've just had my, you'll find this difficult to believe, but I've just had my first ride in a police car. Uh, <laughs> almost impossible to fathom, I know, how I have not been chucked in the back of a paddy wagon before now. Uh, but I haven't, never have. Um, and they, the uh, officers who are taking such good care of us were so kind as to uh, pick me up from the airport, whisk me away. I've no idea where my luggage is or my speech, uh, but <laughs> fortunately you're in very experienced hands. Uh, I'm sorry to keep you waiting, uh, but in my defense, unlike everything else that goes wrong in my life, this is not my fault. <laughs> Where's Michael Voris? Where are you? You were supposed to drive me to Cleveland, did you forget? I got, a <laughs> I got a text saying, oh yeah, no, we're doing something else. I, oh, okay, all right then. And thus began the journey of woes that has led me here. This, the, no, look, I won't bore you with the details, but I will because I want to share the pain a little bit. <laughs> I left the house at 7.57 this morning and I checked because I was sending somebody a text saying it's so early. Um, I'm not normally up till, you know, so 7 p.m. Uh, and I looked, you know, I looked at 7.57 uh, that's when I started my journey. I've been to New York from Miami, back to Fort Lauderdale, and now finally here. So thank you for waiting for me, because however long you think you've been waiting, my day's been worse, okay? <laughs> but I'm here, and I didn't want to miss the opportunity to talk to you, um, because I've been through a journey lately. I wanted to share with you a little bit. I'm not going to talk for 45 minutes. So I'll talk for maybe 20, and then we'll do a Q&A, because I want to hear from you guys, and it's always more interesting. Um, I am here in this stage and also alive, thanks to the grace of um, God and a few people in this room, Michael Voris. Um, <laughs> you know you've got that friend who saves your life and you just hate him forever as a result. Uh, you know, there's a deep-seated fraternal resentment. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, thanks, it's great. <laughs> um, no, um, I'm, I'm here thanks to, thanks to God and thanks to those people, and I'm, I'm here, um, well, you might not imagine that my journey, that my cause, yeah, also, by the way, I got tomato all over myself on United. I was, I was looking at it, I was thinking, oh, um, they, brought, they brought around this, 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 have you flown lately? This hideous poultry post-COVID selection they bring around. This, this sort of rancid basket of nothing. Uh, you know, oh, it's awful, it's awful. So I thought, you know, oh, well, I'll, I'll just pick out the vegetables from this sandwich I grabbed, because I can't have any of the rest of it. Thanks, Lent. Um, <laughs> so, I'll just pick out the vegetables. This was on my third flight today. I pick out the vegetables, and of course, I'm not wearing my tie yet, because, you know, I was just sort of running, running through, running through, running through. And I, and I lift out this sort of wilted, brown-cornered lettuce. And I thought, oh, well, that at least looks as though it would have been edible last week. Uh, and I go to eat it, and of course, <laughs> One, sorry, sorry, about, so sorry about that if you spot anything. You know what? If nothing else I'm sorry to arrive in such a mess. If nothing else convinces you that I've turned my life around, I didn't even do my hair. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, we'll, we'll get to serious stuff. Um, <laughs> I uh, went through what most homosexuals go through, the formative period of life in which we don't find it easy to relate to other men and we don't uh, get on really with boys in a sort of uh, normal platonic athletic kind of way and instead we have some sort of weird dysfunctional relationship with them and I also of course uh, as many of you will know went through clerical sexual abuse as well and at the time I didn't perceive it as being that bad I even uh, thought of myself as the aggressor in the situation which some people do um, it wasn't until much later in my life 
that I realized that my mother was right when she said, I'm not accepting this. Get over it. I said, all right. It's kind of who I am. Uh, she said, no, it's not who you are. It's who your grandmother's made you with all of her gay friends. I said, okay, all right, bit much, bit much. And my dad just sort of said, um, well, son, I never want to see it. I never want to hear about it. I never want to know about it. But if anyone ever breaks your heart, they'll end up in a body bag in the woods. Um, I thought, like, well, fair enough. Thanks, Dad. That's a bit of a better reaction than Mum. Uh, <laughs> at least you'll kill for me. Um, <laughs> I guess. <laughs> and it took 20 years to realize that my mother was loving me and not rejecting me. And 20 years to realize that, although it was in part her own bad parenting, uh, that... Well, it was. That's what my therapist says, anyway. <laughs> a conversion therapy is great. It's a bit like feminism. You get to offload everything you've ever done wrong on someone else. It's fantastic. Oh, your dad didn't, your dad didn't play ball with you enough. Well, that must be it. As opposed to, well, you got tempted, you liked your sin, didn't you? And you lent in for two decades. So it took me a long time to realize that my mother wasn't rejecting me, but was instead instituting tough love. And part of that is thanks to Michael and part, of course, to, to God. So thank you to both of them and the other people. And there are some inspirations in this room as well, people that I have watched slack jawed in awe at their courage, Father Altman, um, you know, all kinds of people in here that I, I greatly respect and admire. And so it's, 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 it is, people always say this in America, and I'm sorry to be like that cynical Brit, when people come up and they say, oh, I'm so blessed and honored and humbled to be here. You're not. You think you deserve to be there, and you're mad they didn't give you more time to talk. Um, but I actually am. I actually am. And, uh, and uh, I'm just saying, people say it lightly, don't they? Sorry, I'm very dehydrated because I've been in airplane air conditioning for nine hours. I practically flew to Bombay today. In fact, I wish I had. <laughs> anyway, honored to be here. Um, <laughs> <laughs> when I unknowingly chose to live that life, I was condemning myself to a lifestyle, a set of disordered but indulged urges that condemned me to loneliness, to addictions, and to a variety of other things. You know, the, that, that, uh, that great expression, you let one sin in and the rest will follow. Well, they did. Uh, a lot of them, all the time, until there was almost nothing else in my life except the endless pursuit of dopamine and pleasure. Now, I haven't entirely eradicated the pursuit of pleasure from my life, I will confess. But I've found, by the way, one of the main reasons you should tell your kids, or if you're of the right age yourself, not to get into this stuff is I have permanently fried the reward circuits in my brain, the dopamine centers. They're not like the what, what organ is it that regenerates liver? Um, they're not, anyway, they're not like that. Um, once you've fried these circuits, they don't come back without decades of recalibration. And when somebody has been pleasure-seeking aggressively, seeking more and more and more exciting and transgressive, disordered, sinful things, you end up in a state called anhedonia, where you find it almost impossible to take pleasure in the everyday. And as a Brit whose culture revolves around talking about the weather and having cups of tea, this is especially challenging. Thank you, sir. Thank you for everything. Did you get my luggage, by the way? Oh, brilliant. Thanks, thanks, thanks. My speech is in there, but I don't think I need it. We're doing all right, aren't we? Yeah, okay, good. Okay, all right, all right, good. Um, thanks. So don't do it, because I'm currently struggling not just with the demands of breaking myself free from what my body is telling me it craves, but also from recalibrating my life downwards again to find joy in, in the ordinary. Now, I've managed to do this because, of course, everybody in this room knows we have joy to be found, too, in the extraordinary, in the supernatural, in the holy and the heavenly. And that's about the only thing that's got me through, because without Christ, I am fairly sure that I would be dead. I woke up one morning, and I've lived quite a lonely life. 
I, for those of you who don't know who I am, um, the short version is I was briefly, for about 18 months, one of the most famous people in the world. Um, and then it all sort of came crashing down, uh, uh, entirely predictably, I suppose. And I helped to put a president in office and wrote great books and all the rest of it. But it, I mean, I've had like $6 and I've had $6 million in my checking account. And I wasn't any happier at either extreme. And the success and finding what I thought was love wasn't doing it for me. I was still waking up in the middle of the night empty and unsatisfied, unfulfilled, because I had, as the expression goes, a God-shaped hole in my heart. But I don't anymore. Uh, at least it's filling up. It's like one of those agonizingly slow uh, water uh, uh, things, that, you know, the, the, the water timers or something. It, feel, it feels like it's going to take decades to fill up, but at least I can now see the light at the end of the tunnel. And I, when I look beyond my sexuality stuff and think about, well, what, what else should I care about? I'm reminded of something my mother said to me once, which seemed cruel. Sorry. This is what happened. I don't even know what time zone I'm in. Oh, sorry. She said, if I'd known you were going to turn out like this, I would have cut you out of me like a tumor. Now, I'm a fan of tough love, but mum, that was a bit much. Um, so I, this, this kind of haunted me for a long time. Um, and it made me realize that since now I understand that there is hope for people who are afflicted with these desires and disorders, I must also at the same time, surely, be the most fanatically and ferociously pro-life person in the world. Because if they discover this gay gene thing, they're going to start just lopping heads off in the womb. They're going to start doing all kinds of appalling things. And, and I realized at that point, I suppose, I'd always kind of known that. Which is why even when I was in the depths, the desperate depths of sodomitical despair, at that point, I nonetheless still was giving talks on college campuses saying abortion is the, the greatest moral horror of our age. So I've never changed on that, like I've never changed on the gay thing, but I guess I've stopped being a hypocrite. Um, and now I really understand why and what it's for and how important it is. So I've, I've started a couple of different endeavors now in, my, in this sort of second chapter of my life. And one of them is a, um, a, a conversion therapy. I like to call it conversion therapy because it annoys the left more. Uh, reparative therapy. So, why did you just stop dodging? Just call it. I can't believe you. Are you doing conversion therapy? Yup. <laughs> but it doesn't. Yup. Uh, that's, that's one thing um, I'm doing. And the other is that I've decided to dedicate um, the remaining decades of my life, in addition to helping other men get out from where I am currently getting out of, the other thing I want to dedicate my life to is protection of the unborn. And it's emerged. Um, I perhaps didn't do a very good um, job of explaining why, but it has emerged in tandem, I think, with my realizations about the etiology of my old sexual orientation, just why it matters so much. And I'll talk more about it over the coming decades and maybe in a book or something, who cares. But um, I started to have some fun with one, and I invite you to help me with the other. Uh, with, with, the, with the gay stuff, I'm kind of on home territory there. I know what I'm doing. Uh, I, I, I gave a, speak at, a speech at Penn State, recently, um, where uh, they, they paid me a lovely, big, huge sum of money. I don't take speaking fees anymore, um, but I say to people, if you want to make a donation to the conversion therapy clinic, then by all means do so. Uh, and so the student association managed to get a ton of money out of them. And I ended up having about $25,000 in ticket sales and fees and all the rest of it, a huge sum of money. And I put it up on screen. I said, thanks, Penn State, for your generous donation to the Milo Clinic. Um, uh, rescuing young men from the uh, ravages and disorders of same-sex attraction. Uh, the college was not very happy. Um, <laughs> what I had done was successfully manipulate a publicly funded institution in America into directly funding conversion therapy for the first time in maybe 50 years. <laughs> uh, 
the problem with that trick is you can sort of only pull it off once. Uh, but I'm good at that kind of thing. That's what I do for a living. So that's, that's well, not for a living anymore. That's just what I do. Um, just sort of gradually selling off the houses and the wardrobes to fund all this, you know. Uh, no, but, but uh, that's what I'm doing, and um, I'm good at that. But this is the first time I've ever spoken to an audience, uh, a pro-life audience of this scale and scope and seriousness. So I would like to fairly quickly move on to a Q&A. I would invite you, please, to, to come up and, and, and don't think you're bothering me or anything. All day tomorrow, I'm going to be around. I would love to meet you uh, if you have ideas for me, things that I could, uh, uh, ways in which I could help, things at which I could speak. Who can I help raise money for? I'm very good at it. Uh, so so um, please, I invite you to make use of me as an instrument because this is one of the two things I would wish to dedicate the rest of my life to. Um, and uh, and, and I'm, I'm just very, very grateful to you for having me. Uh, there's lots else I wanted to say, but uh, it's in my suitcase. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to switch to a Q&A and invite you guys to ask me questions. And, and we'll probably get through almost everything I was going to talk about, if that's all right. So thank you so much for having me. Thank you so much for listening. Um, And uh, I know you probably haven't had much chance to get those cards around, but maybe we could start. Um, we could start listening. Well, we could start, start answering while you're still writing them up. How about that? Do we have anything to? We're find? ready. We're ready. Oh, we're, we're ready. Started. Splendid. Oh, yes, sir. My friend, let's go ahead. Yes. Um, I had to move to the middle here so that you look at everybody here and not at me over there in the corner. So, Milo, uh, thank you for being here, by the way, and thank you for going through all of the travails that you had to to get here. It's very appreciated. I know. By I'm not going to lie. There were moments at which I thought. <laughs> You know okay, I'm, got... I'm going to invent an upset stomach, but I didn't do it. I'm a new man now. I didn't do it. <laughs> Milo, the first question is one that I know is going to be a, a very interesting one for everyone. What advice can you give to straight parents of a homosexual son? Well, you don't have a homosexual son. You were just really crap at raising him. Um, so... Sorry, uh, look, you know the trans thing? I'm convinced that, that this trans thing, I mean, mothers, single mothers especially, love, no offense to single moms, I know not everybody chooses to find themselves in that position, but for people who do, much offense, because um, this, the single moms are homosexual factories, you know? Uh, and, and because they, do, they don't have this present, uh, this is why, by the way, there are certain communities certain communities where fatherlessness is a problem that report higher incidences of homosexuality, a fact completely impossible to reconcile with anything we're told about homosexuality from science. Um, it's completely impossible to explain unless you admit that it's probably mostly parenting and a little bit of predisposition in some people. So you don't have a gay son, you're just a crap dad. Um, and I would encourage, if you can't form a meaningful bond with your son, find someone who can. Uh, find a sports coach who can. Find him friends. Do what you can to rescue his ability to form meaningful relationships, with, platonic relationships with people his own, with men his own age and with father figures. And, and if you can't do all that and you can't protect them from abuse, which is the other major way it happens and lots of people have both, um, then I don't know what to tell you except it's on you. You did do something wrong. And I was going to say about the trans thing. Um, the single moms, they love, they love having trans kids. They love trans kids. And the reason they like trans kids is it gets them off the hook. Because these kids aren't trans, they're just, they've just got gay tendencies. And they've got gay tendencies because they're raised by single mothers or crap parents. But if your kid's not gay but instead has a disease, well, it gets you off the hook, doesn't it? It's not my fault. I didn't turn my son gay. He's trans. Excuse me, she's trans. They're a nonsense. Um, so these days, you know, people who don't want to accept responsibility for their own failures as parents will um, inevitably uh, put their young gay son in a dress and call him trans and have parts of him chopped off and inject him with medication and give him pills. Uh, this is what people who cannot accept personal responsibility do. People who can accept personal responsibility shape up, wise up, yes, it is your fault, but you can do something about it. This is my advice to straight parents of gay children. Our next question, Milo, is how do we respond to those who call us homophobic? Uh, with the word, yup. <laughs> <laughs> I think homophobia is about to make a really big comeback. Um, <laughs> You know, fashion goes in cycles, um, <laughs> it's like a pendulum. You know, no, I mean, you know, I, I hoped, I hope to be. 
Look, there are mannerisms and things about my person. You're watching me up here on stage being all swishy, and you're thinking, mm-hmm. Uh, <laughs> I have the personality I have, sorry. Uh, there's not much I can do about it, and I'm nearly 40, uh, and I'm going to sound like this forever. I'm just going to trade on you all thinking it's more, Briti- it's more British than it is gay. Um, <laughs> your children won't have that excuse, so get it early. Um, <laughs> no, I mean, uh, um, I'm sorry, I've forgotten the question. What homophobia. Oh, homophobia, yes. Um, yes, no, homophobia is great uh, because it is frightening. It's frightening. I mean, who, who can deny? It's scary. It's, they're scary. They're frightening people. They look like, look, I look at, I don't, you, this is far too a wholesome and family-friendly audience for me to describe in any detail whatsoever what happens at something called the Folsom Street Fair in San Francisco. But some of you will know. And if you don't know, at least think of gay pride. I mean, these are not the, these are not the behaviors. This is not the appearance of well-adjusted people. There's a crazed sort of empty, vapid look in their eyes. They have a sort of rictus grins as though they're desperately trying to persuade you of how happy they are. And the trick, the clue, the, it's in the name. It's that inversion, pride, both as a good thing rather than quite a bad sin maybe the ultimate bad sin, but also it's an inversion because what they're exhibiting isn't pride at all. It's shame. It's shame and self-loathing. And I think it's right and proper to be afraid of it, but it's also right and proper to confront those things of which you are afraid. So the answer to homophobia is, yes, please. Um, But it's also, and how can I help you get out of the situation that you are in? Uh, I would very much like, if at all possible, if I can in my life, to spearhead a revival of homophobia. Um, (laughs) Because it's an act of love, you know. Um, I mean, we're joking, but it is. Uh, Because let me tell you, after the life I've lived, nobody in this room is as homophobic as me. Uh, And I very much intend to spread that uh, as wide as possible. And of course, what we mean is not... um, Uh, rasping, hissing, spitting, loathing of another human being. It is love for the person, great and tremendous compassion for the situation that they are in, an understanding of where it comes from, but an absolute refusal to accommodate even a bit of it. Don't do it. Milo, our next question is, what are your thoughts about same-sex couples adopting children? Oh, uh, well, um, I'm... I know that Catholic moral teaching is, uh, you know, this way and that way on capital punishment, but uh, I'm all for it. Um, so, uh, <laughs> I'm just, it's a growth period. Any, any, by the way, anything I say um, that isn't uh, perfectly and strictly in line with, uh, you know, Catholic moral theology or the catechism or anything else, uh, it's Michael's fault. Um, <laughs> so, you can, you can see him afterwards, uh, and he will set me right. Uh, I'm still a baby Christian, so I apologize if I'm, I'm stumbling through any minefields or whatever. But, um, uh, I mean, look, uh, homosexuals reproduce through sexual abuse, since they can't reproduce naturally. It's an abomination to us and to the, and to the Lord because, uh, well, for a variety of reasons, so the things that it makes a mockery of, but also because it is a sterile act. And they can only acquire children through burglary, and they can only reproduce through buggery. And these two things are abominations, um, and any homosexual couple in the market for a child needs to be, uh, well, I think at a bare minimum, they need a, a long stay in a psychiatric institution to figure out why it is exactly that these people who can't reproduce nonetheless want to be around kids. No thanks. No thank you. Milo, in your opinion, what can we do about gay priests and bishops? Um, well, I get the, the same answer as before, um, <laughs> uh, which, is, which is kind of true, really, because on the you know you've got these so American society is now ruled by the least appropriate members. You know, got, the most crazy people are the ones who are telling us how to be normal. The most warlike people are the people telling us how to preserve peace. The, you know, the least pious people are telling us what God would want for us. Um, and unfortunately, in our own church, the least appropriate pastors and shepherds uh, are, you know, with, you know, they have mitres. I... I mean, I think four-fifths at a minimum 
of the Bishops' Conference needs to be uh, pushed off a cliff. Um, but <laughs> after having been... After, ha <laughs> after having been given appropriate uh, opportunity to repent, obviously, which they won't, um, but you've got to give it to them. Uh, but, you know, after that, I'd be perfectly happy to see the back of a lot of them. I mean, there's no place for homosexual clergy whatsoever. Um, all it does is... Inc I mean, it does nothing good or healthy, and it, 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 um, all, all it does really, aside from the abuse, aside from the nonsense they always find themselves in, you know, I mean, have you heard their homilies? Ooh. Um, aside from all of that, uh, you know, uh, 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 all the other stuff they do, it perpetuates the church's primary problem, which is a shortage of a, of a healthy and proper understanding of masculinity. And how on earth can we hope? I mean, I say earlier, you know, you're bad parents. Go find someone who can make a healthy connection with your son. Well, it's not going to be a Catholic priest at the moment, is it? Not in America in 2022. I'm sorry, but it isn't, most likely, unless you're the one in a hundred person who has a good priest. Well, that's not fair. Lots of priests are good, but bishops, certainly. Um, there's no place for it because it perpetuates the biggest single problem in the, in the church, which is a lack of any understanding of the virtues of manhood and um, the proper practice of masculinity. And, and you know, it's why I ended up like that in the first place. Uh, so there's, there's, there's no space for it. And the problems that are in the clergy are not thanks to celibacy. They're thanks to not enough celibacy. And the problems in the clergy are not... It's that same thing, isn't it? You let one sin in and the others will follow. Uh, there is a connection, although people are not supposed to talk about it, between homosexuality and pedophilia and homosexuality and pederasty. Um, and it's not necessarily... I mean, there's nothing about Catholicism. There's nothing about our faith that attracts uh, people who want to diddle kids. But the culture of the church in, in teaching people that it's going to look the other way, that it's going to turn a blind eye, creates a space that attracts people who want to do even worse things than merely have sex with one another in seminary. It attracts people who need an environment where nobody asks too many questions so that they can do even worse things. And so you have to cut it all out, root and branch, and uh, actually abide by things that have already been laid down by previous popes. No homosexuals in seminary, anytime, anyhow, for any reason. Milo, this question seems like a bit of a challenge to you for one of the other things that you said. Why does bad parent, or excuse me, I think they mean to say what? What does bad parenting have to do with your kids having homosexual tendencies? Well, some kids are born, there's no point denying it, with a, a, perhaps a, a predisposition, a predilection. But as far as I can tell, and from the literature, and you know, based on me talking to a lot of therapists, interviewing some for my clinic, um, and not just, I'm not talking about my own experience, uh, but based on what we know, and what the faith teaches us, but also what the therapists who are experts in this teaches us, what we know about this stuff is that although some people may be born with predispositions or predilections, which we might phrase in this room as uh, challenges, trials, tests from the Almighty, um, these things don't flourish into a homosexual person without other conditions being satisfied as well. Typically, on the whole, almost always. We must speak in generalities or we can't communicate at all. Um, on the whole, people are born with some sort of little pre predisposition or uh, predilection. And on the whole, now living in an enormously not just gay-friendly or gay-permissive, but, but sort of gay-positive culture, coupled with a, um, a terrible role model that most men set. I mean, the women in America are amazing. The men in this country are the pits. I mean, you know, you, you come to rooms like this and you're like, oh, finally, I found some actual fathers. Uh, no, I mean, the men in this country are a joke. Uh, they just sat back and watched their whole country stolen in 2020, did nothing. I mean, it's a banana republic because the men here did nothing. Um, the... You know, and to say nothing of what happened in the years following, this country has been wrecked, wrecked by demonic saboteurs, and the men did nothing because they're godless and because they didn't have dads themselves or not good dads. Um, you know, it, it, all of this stuff, as I mentioned earlier, the, the, the behaviors that we're talking about, for the most part, flow from an inability to form uh, 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 authentic, platonic relationships with other men. 
And this begins in the home. The primary problem is fatherlessness. And America has a sort of fatherless culture. This is the gay capital of the world. It's not Israel anymore. It's not even uh, uh, Iran, the number two uh, capital for transition surgery in the world. Remember uh, Ahmadinejad, oh, we don't have homosexuality in Iran. No, because you make them all cut things off and pretend to be women. Uh, this is the gay capital of the world. America's number one export is now homosexuality. In such a culture, it's, an, it's amazing anyone grows up straight. What you must do, if you don't have one at home, if your husband's a deadbeat, uh, <laughs> or whatever, is provide your male children. Look, there are ways in which boys and girls are sort of better able to deal with, with different situations. Um, early in life, boys do not survive without healthy male role models. Later in life, women, I think, have a lot more uh, struggle if they're still alone and childless into their 30s and 40s. Um, men go crazy without dads early. Women go crazy without husbands later. Uh, but whatever it is, early on, a, a boy needs a father. And if we can, through what we know from our faith and what we know from the country we live in, do the best to provide fathers to all of our young men, whether they're our own children or not, then we will have a good shot at reversing the precipitous... I mean, have you seen what Ge the Gen Z self-reported gay statistics? You know, how many, how many people born after Jurassic Park think they're... Nothing to do with Jurassic Park, but how many... <laughs> terrified gay by the T-Rex. <laughs> T-Rex, you know. Uh, how many people after Jurassic Park think they're gay? Like a quarter of the population. Uh, if we are to save this country and save the souls in it, we have to stop providing fathers to these young men. Um, and, and I'm sorry, but that begins with taking personal responsibility for raising your own children. That's a, um, a very interesting answer given the next question. This attendee wants to know, Milo, is there a connection between parental divorce and thus the departure of fathers? With gay daughters, is there a connection there? Well, there's no such thing as divorce, so I don't really understand the question, but um, <laughs> there are merely delinquent parents uh, and uh, people living in sin and lying to themselves. Um, was the question uh, a link between divorce and gay fathers? <laughs> Sorry, the question there are, was, is there a connection between divorce and gay daughters. daughters. There aren't any gay women. The way sons are. There aren't any gay women. Lesbianism is not a thing. It's, it's not a thing. It's not a thing. I mean, it's just not a thing. There, there are no lesbians. Uh, lesbianism is a, is a sort of uh, political phenomenon uh, that exists in women who have a much more malleable sexuality, as the studies have shown us. Uh, they can will themselves into liking other sexes in a way that men cannot. Um, I'm trying, but, you know, <laughs> celibacy is the best I can hope for at the moment, let me tell you. If I could do what girls do and just, you know, spend six months with a woman instead, I mean, I would do it, but men typically cannot do these things, whereas women, more often, more usually, for some reason, can. They shouldn't, but they do and they can. Um, there aren't any lesbians. They're just uh, women who uh, are retreating in fear, I think. It's not, a, it's not really a sexuality. Milo, the next question is, are you attracted to women now? And if so... Can I introduce you to my niece? <laughs> um, <laughs> for the sake of your niece, <laughs> I would describe it as an aspiration. Um, look, I'm not going to lie to you. People do not just sort of say, oh, I've got God now. I'm going to go and bang lots of girls. Um, it doesn't work like that. Uh, and I would say, so, sorry for the language. Um, I lasted a really long time. Uh, it's so, so much worse, much worse than the gay thing is leaving profanity behind. I cannot tell you. I, look, I was trained on a broadsheet newspaper in London where the C-bomb is every third word. And trying to extract that from my vocabulary in a country that finds it much more offensive than, than back home and in a faith that, that forbids it, it has not been easy. I mean, you know, touch wood. I don't know if this is wood. Is it wood? Probably not. But um, touch wood, wherever it is. Um, uh, you know, I'm doing all right on the sex stuff. I am not doing all right on the swearing stuff. So uh, you, you're, lucky. you're lucky I went that long. Um, sorry in advance. Uh, what was that? Solidarity. Solidarity, yeah, thanks. thanks. 
I've forgotten the question again. This is, this is what happens, ladies and gentlemen, was, when, this is what happens when you have a, 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 a sodomitical drug adult mind. I am nearly 40, I have the mind of a 65 year old. I mean, a brilliant 65 year old, but, but, a, but a 65 year old, honestly, I mean, I can't see, I can't remember, I don't know anyone's names. Oh, the niece, the niece. Um, so, uh, <laughs> so I don't do live TV anymore, I can't remember anything. Uh, Look, only about one in ten people who are ready for it and really commit themselves to the process of uh, conversion therapy, reparative therapy, whatever, about one in ten, perhaps, will end up having a meaningful, long-lasting, uh, productive, meaning a uh, you know, repro reproducing relationship with a woman and experience the unique and extraordinary joy, so far denied to me, um, of co-reproduction with Almighty God, the most extraordinary and incredible thing anybody can do. And the rest of us sort of aspire to celibacy. And I say the rest of us not to foreclose uh, the possibility uh, or, or to, to express any lack of hope, but just to say that I'm early on in the journey. Uh, I, I sort of, if I could be, if I could be uh, America's most eligible celibate. Uh, <laughs> uh, that, that for me at the moment is a good thing to aim for. But, but I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm, well into a year without f sliding backwards into all that stuff, um, and before that was almost a year. So we're getting to... Milo, why do you believe the trans issue is so much more protected and viciously promoted by the left today than even the gay issue? Uh, late in the lifetime of every major civilization, and this is true of... Uh, of um, uh, Rome and Greece uh, and all the others, uh, late in the uh, decadent decline of empires, a few things always happen. One of them is that um, the uh, empire forgets to defend how to defend itself. It forgets how to maintain, yes, its borders. It forgets how to marshal its uh, armed forces properly. Happened to Rome, it was overrun by the uh, Visigoths, uh, and, and it happened to every major civilization. One of the other things that happens, and Camille Paglia, who is an interesting academic, uh, although she has some very unpleasant things to say about pederasty, but otherwise quite interesting, uh, she points out in great uh, and very persuasive detail, I think it's in Sexual Personae, uh, her, her first big book, um, how every civilization on the brink of collapse experiences an explosion in gender madness, what we might describe as, um, uh, you know, sort of what, what, was, what was merely a bit of artistic flippancy and experimentation in the 1970s and then seemed to sort of die down a bit. Um, rockers didn't want to be in, you know, dressed like David Bowie forever, like 10 years was enough. Um, it's, it, it sort of, it's like political correctness, really. It really sort of came back then in, in its uh, metastasized final form as cancel culture. Um, in addition to being no longer able to protect their borders or defend themselves, dying civilizations are characterized, um, and they have been for, for four and a half thousand years of human history, by gender confusion, by gender madness, by the indulgence of extraordinary fantasies about people's uh, sexuality and gender identity. So I can only, um, I can only read this as uh, um, the sort of late stage terminal decline of the American empire, and indeed of the West in general, which is why I think our focus has to be rather on, rather than on saving America, to be on saving souls. Because at this point, that has to be our priority. Our priority has to be saving babies in the womb and saving homosexuals from their urges. Our priority has to be on saving souls, because uh, many of you in this room will not want to hear this, um, but history teaches us a right. It teaches us reliably. It teaches us correctly. And if we are alive and awake to the lessons of history, we cannot but realize that this is an empire about to fall. And when they fall, they fall fast. It's over in a generation. The most important thing that we can do now is save as many souls as we can. And that's what I am dedicating the rest of my life to and what I invite you to join me on.
Milo, when you were writing for Breitbart and living an openly gay life, I remember you tweeting a response that said Catholicism was the best religion. What was your relationship with the church then? Did you know the truth intellectually before embracing it? Yeah, people try to be nice and say, oh, you've converted to Catholicism. I'm like, no, actually, unlike you, I was a cradle Catholic, but um, I wasn't a very good Catholic for a really long time. So uh, my first job, or maybe it was my second job, um, I'm 65 now, so I, I struggle to remember. Uh, but <laughs> Uh, my first or second job was at the Catholic Herald in London, which some of you will at least know from online or something. Uh, it's kind of like our conservative uh, um, Catholic uh, newspaper weekly. It, 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 at least then, when I was writing for it, it was very good. Like when I was at Breitbart, it was very good. Um, <laughs> yeah, <so laughs> publications are their people, you know, when Steve Bannon and I left Breitbart. Mm. Um, when I, I was there and I was kind of tiptoeing back into the faith after a, a, a mucky and miserable and, and lonely adolescence, I sort of, uh, unfortunately for my spiritual journey, became really popular and successful, which is nice because I've got like a great house and everything, but um, it, it put me back 15 years or more because swept up in that popularity, I began to give myself free passes thought, look, I'm so great, and I'm talking to so many people, and so many people like at my talks and buying my books and everything, that I'm doing so much good, and I'm making so much of a difference that I can give myself a free pass on this one, you know? I can be gay. And everything, I mean, everything else I'm doing will outweigh it, until one day somebody said, uh, I think that's Islam. I don't think it works. Like, yeah, there's, no, there's no feather of truth when you get up to see St. Peter. It's just like, oh, sodomite, boo. Uh, you know, so... <laughs> I don't think it works that way. And I thought, oh, oh really? Uh, well, never mind. Uh, another 10 years went by. And um, anyway, so, 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 so the answer is, I mean, my grandmother who raised me, which is another part of the problem, by the way, you will see among uh, flamboyant young men, very often they have a little bit too close a relationship with their grandmothers. Uh, so if you are a parent who is indulging the, uh, w just the grandmother of a young boy. Yeah, it's danger zone, okay? Danger zone. If your little son is like just enamored with his glamorous grandmother, danger zone, okay? My grandmother used to sweep down the stairs in lace and leather and pearls, and then 20 years later, so did I. Uh, so, <laughs> <laughs> so dial it down a bit. Have him spend some time with granddad, too. Uh, <laughs> um, what were we talking about? Let's move on. Next question. Well, actually, Milo, um, and please do not attack the messenger. Oh, we've, no, is, no, look, I've run this, so late. I've run so late. And you've been here for so long. Well, look, in, yeah, thank, no, no, thanks. No, no, no. It, go ahead. No, I apologize. I was just sorry. apologizing to the audience. 65, sorry. Don't get mad at me because I'm about to cut, a, cut this off and put an end to tonight's events. I would like to say, and I, I bet I can speak for everyone here, your energy is infectious. I know you could do this for another three hours. I would have been much better if my flight had been on time <laughs> and in the right direction. But so no, I'm sorry that I was a mess. But. Thank you for your energy. Thank you for your passion. Thank you for your sincerity. Ladies and gentlemen, Milo Yiannopoulos. Thank you. Thank you. God bless you. Thank you.